parables of the hidden treasure and the pearl. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. The parable of the net. Once again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was let down into the lake and caught all kinds of fish. When it was full, the fishermen pulled it up on the shore. Then they sat down and collected the good fish in baskets, but threw the bad away. This is how it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous and throw the wicked into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all these things, Jesus asked? Yes, they replied. He said to them, Therefore, every teacher of the law who has been instructed about the kingdom of heaven is like the owner of a house who brings out of his storeroom new treasures as well as old. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Lord, we come before you during this time of teaching. We ask your blessing upon these words I'm about to speak, Lord. May they, may they speak to open hearts and not to closed minds. In the name of Christ the King, I ask these things. Amen. So the title of my sermon this morning is The Greater Treasure. You know, i got to tell you, when I was young, my mom and dad didn't have very much money. Old cars, old clothes, patched up pants, darned up socks, and taped together shoes. To make everything last a little longer was just a way of life. And then one day I told my mom, you know, mom, one day I'm going to be rich. Those words set me on a circuitous course to find my dreams. I began to search for those riches only to discover that to attain those riches took a lot of hard work and a lot of personal sacrifice. And then one day I made an observation. A man that I knew with lots and lots of money, more money than he would have ever spend, was out shoveling the snow in his, for his business in the cold. And I asked of him, why don't you hire somebody to shovel the snow? You can afford it. And his reply was something like this. I need to save as much as I can. I might run out of money. And I learned that day that chasing after ridges is like a horse, chasing after a carrot that is dangled out in front of him. And like the horse never catches the carrot, some rich people never have enough. Oh, I didn't change my dream, but I sure rearranged my priorities. Jesus tells this parable in Luke 12. The ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I will do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and then I will store my grain and my goods. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you prepared for yourself? Remember what I said? Some rich people never have enough. They always want to build bigger barns. Now don't go misunderstand what I'm saying. There's nothing wrong with being rich if you're living your life for the Lord. First Timothy 6 teaches this about money. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. 
Money is not the problem. It is the love of money that sometimes causes people to wander from the faith. Now, if you are fortunate, blessed to have some wealth, hear what Jesus says to you in Luke 12. From everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. And from the one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. He who has ears, listen. Now turning to our reading today, from Matthew 13, 44. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. And when a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought the field. To grasp the depth of this verse for us today, we need to understand the times, the customs of Jesus' day. Understanding that, we will, it will help us in realizing the depth of this teaching of this verse. First of all, we need to jump over the ethical dilemma this situation poses. If you found the treasure on somebody's property, instead of burying it again, then buying the property on the cheap to claim the prize, wouldn't you morally and ethically need to tell the owner of the property? Oh, by the way, there's a buried treasure in your field. And to resolve, resolve our question, we need to realize that in Jesus' day, there were no banks. There was no stock market in which to store your money. So it was not uncommon to bury your money in the ground. We see this in another parable of Jesus that he shares in Matthew 25. The master had given three servants money to invest while he was away on a journey. Two servants did something with what they were giving. But what did the third servant do with his share? This is what he said. I went out and hid your talent. I buried your money in the ground. So burying your wealth was not uncommon. Along with that, often an unexpected death, and with it, the secret hiding place went to the grave with the owner. Later, he who then bought the deceased man's field probably bought it not knowing there was a buried treasure as part of his purchase. Besides, in our verse, the guy who owned the field didn't even know that there was treasure within the field. So it really wasn't his to begin with. So the second custom to understand is this. Rabbinic law said whoever found something, it was theirs to keep. We understand it as finders keepers. Our ethics today would expect us to inform the owner of the field that there was a treasure within it. In Jesus' day, the customs and the ethics were different. Let's look at the man now who bought the treasure. He recognized the value of what he found and what did he do? The verse says, in his joy went and sold all he had and bought the field. The treasure was worth more than he had. He gave up all he owned to acquire something of greater value. The rich young ruler didn't recognize the treasure that Jesus offered up to him. He asked the deed, Jesus, teacher, what good thing must I do to inherit eternal life? Remember that the man in today's parable went and sold all that he had to get the treasure. Listen to Jesus' answer to the rich young ruler's question, What must I do? In Matthew 19, Jesus answered, If you want to be perfect, go and sell your possessions and give to the poor, and then you will have treasure in heaven. Then, come, follow me. What did the rich young ruler do? It's what he didn't do that is the point of the parable. When the young man heard this, he went away 
He went away sad because he had great wealth. The love of money kept the rich young ruler from maybe being a disciple. He heard the same invitation from Jesus the other disciples heard. Come, follow me. Two contrasting parables. One man willing to sell all that he had to acquire the treasure, which is the kingdom of heaven, and the other man hanging on to what he had, not wanting to give up what he owned for a greater treasure that Jesus was more than willing to give to him. A lesson for all of us to consider. What has the Lord been pressing on your heart? To give, to be a missionary, to get more involved in church ministry, or maybe even to personally just draw closer to God. Why don't you dig in your heart just a little deeper? Maybe there's a treasure waiting there to be discovered. Second parable for today from Jesus says this. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. Once again, to fully grasp the value of a fine pearl, we under need to understand the times in which this parable was spoken. Pearls were the most valuable gem available in the world at that time. If you owned pearls, likely you owned a fortune. So precious were pearls that those who dove into the sea would tie rocks around themselves in order to sink to the deep ocean floor. And there they would search for clams, hoping to bring up a prized pearl before they ran out of breath and drowned. The Talmud, the ancient readings or writings of the Jews, said this about pearls. Pearls are beyond price. Does not that help us understand what Jesus said in Matthew 7 even better? Give not what is holy unto the dogs, neither cast your pearls before the swine, lest they trample them under their feet. Don't be giving what is priceless and of great value to that which is of least value, the pig. Just an aside, where else will we see pearls one day? In Revelation 21, we read this about the entrance to heaven. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Every several gate was a pearl. For the second time, I ask, what did he who found such a pearl of great value do? The Bible says he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. The man who found the treasure sold all that he had to buy it. The man who found the pearl of great value sold all that he had to acquire it. And these two parables there are hidden treasures. And like both men, one had to dig to find the hidden treasure, and the other searched for a long time to find that one perfect pearl. So too, we must dig and search. But some act, where do we even begin? Ladies and gentlemen, the treasure map is in your hands, and it's called the Bible. A word the Lord Jesus Christ. You know that the treasure about which these parables speak is the kingdom of God, don't you? Some people just sort of stumble into finding the Lord. The great preacher Charles Spurgeon went to church one Sunday as was his custom. He was comfortable where he was at with his religiosity. He wasn't really looking for Jesus. Not looking until the preacher yelled out, Look to Jesus! Look! 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 The darkness rolled away from Spurgeon's eyes 
And this is what he said. I saw Jesus. He had stumbled into finding the greatest treasure of all, Jesus. And then there's the man searching after a pearl of great value, maybe for even a long time, praying, reading, meditating on the Word of God. He, with purpose and with intentionality, seeks after the Lord, once blind, but now he sees. Whether you stumble into the Lord or you search with purpose, there's a cost to salvation. Both men sold all they had to acquire the treasure of great value. For any one of us to acquire the kingdom of God, we must remember that we need to surrender something, our very lives. Paul says this, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Do you get that part of the bargain? Even heaven has a cause. Whosoever believeth in me shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Are you able? Well, you might be able, but are you willing? So here's a summary of these two parables. The kingdom is priceless. The kingdom is hidden because the God of this age has blinded the minds of the unbelievers so they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. The kingdom of heaven is personal. The kingdom is joyous. The kingdom is entered into under different circumstances. But always this one thing there is in common. One must give of himself. So now let's look at these parables, what Jesus is saying, in a different perspective, maybe from the backside. What if any one of us is the treasure the pearl of great value. Now substitute the man who sold all they had to acquire the treasure, the pearl, with Jesus the Christ. Could it be that you are the treasure, the pearl of great value after whom Jesus seeks? John 3.16 says that God so loved the world that He gave His only Son. So if we are the treasure, the pearl of great value. What did God pay to redeem us? To acquire us from the grips of sin? Did not He give of His very best? His only begotten Son? His beloved Son? Like the men in these parables who sold all they had to acquire something even more precious. Did not God, did not Jesus give of His very best? To buy us. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Ask yourself, at what price did Jesus pay to loose the chains of sin for me? Did he not lay it all on the line for your soul? Not only that, like the man who sold all he had to acquire the field with treasure, and then in his joy bought the field, I would suggest that Jesus did no less for each one of us. Even in his death, did he not glorify God and praise Him? Hear this prayer of Jesus in John 17. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had before the world began. Yes, you are the treasure of great value. Don't be wasting such a pearl of great value on stuff or on sin that tarnishes. You have been bought by God at a very great and high price. And now... You need to surrender all to Him. Give God the praise 
and glory and honor this day. Amen.